Welcome fellow freaks, geeks, and nostalgic 90s nerds, not only to my channel, but to the meeting of the Midnight Book Society, our book club that we have all together. As you guys can probably see, I am wearing a thematic 90s shirt because today is April Eve, or <laughs> I don't know, first day of April's Eve. So tomorrow, first day of April, kicks off my big readathon and watchathon called Old School April, where everything I watch and everything I read for the month of April will be old school. So I'm excited. I hope some of you are planning to kick it old school with me, and it's not just going to be me. It doesn't seem like it because I know some of you guys have already said you're joining in, whether that's on YouTube or on Instagram. I really appreciate you guys so very much. And thank you all who are watching live right now. And thank you to those who join and maybe watch after the fact when this is on demand on my channel. I really appreciate each and every one of you, no matter how you're watching this. So yay, April Fool's Day <laughs> Eve. That's what Kelly says. Yes, that's, that's a good way to put it. All right, but enough about hyping up for April, because that's tomorrow. But tonight, right now, we are talking The Troop by Nick Cutter. And I am very excited to talk about this book. Let me show it to you. Yeah. You know, it's kind of weird. Like, in every picture, this book comes out muted, the book cover. But, like, in person, the colors look great. But every picture I've ever taken with this thing, it looks muted. It looks terrible. Not like the cover itself and the design, just like the colors for some reason. They don't pop on a picture. And I've tried like adjusting the contrast and stuff. It just doesn't work well in my pictures. But uh, even when you show it up on camera here, but the contents are freaking banging. Not to use a 90s term, but it's banging. It's awesome. I really loved this book. I don't know how you guys felt about it, but I can't wait to kind of get your opinions because it's not just about me, guys. I want you guys to shout out your opinions in the comments right here, right now. And so, yes, drop those below. Start typing it up, guys, because I want to know, what did you rate this book? Did you give it a three, four, five? I mean, I can't imagine if somebody would give it lower than that because I really do think, even if you think it's super gross, I think that's a pro <laughs> for the book, by the way, if it is super gross, which it is in my opinion. But, um... I think that even if you thought it was gross, there's a great story here if you could get through it. All right. There is another cover that Kelly is shouting out here. I'm going to show her comment. She says, I like the other red cover a smidge better than this cover that I own right here. And I will say, I've seen the red cover, the other version, and I like it a lot. Kelly gave the troop five stars. And spoiler, guys, just to get into what I think especially if you guys don't feel the same way, you might be kind of bummed that I feel this way, but I gave it a five as well. So I don't know if some of you guys were a little disappointed or you didn't like it that much. I will bring up some complaints or negatives or criticisms, I should say, that other people have pointed out. And I, I never shy away from talking about criticisms about a book. So we will dive into that. Justin's here and he says that four and a half out of five, that ain't bad, Justin, that ain't bad. That's a good rating. Monster Blood is here. Hey, how you doing? Monster Blood says, so I read the troop last year, but I'm happy to be here to discuss it and see what everyone thinks. I gave it four stars. Four stars ain't shabby. I have given a lot of books four stars that I've very much enjoyed. We've also got Ashley joining us. Hey, Ashley. Oh, I didn't mean to highlight that one, but she says, woo, -hoo. hey, Ashley. Hopefully my internet holds up as well, because right before I came on, I almost had a disaster. My computer wasn't plugged in. My flipping, uh, camera that I have it is a nice camera. I had it plugged in and it was like freezing and it almost looked like my audio was out of sync and I was getting really scared. So I unplugged my nice camera and I'm just using my freaking simple camera that is attached to my laptop. So I'm sorry about the quality guys. I got scared. The other camera's better quality, but I just got scared with the you know the 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 out of syncness, the, which I thought could happen. And I was like, "No, please don't. I can't mess this up." So I was like, "I'm just going to use my freaking internal camera." Cat is here, my best friend Cat. Hey Cat, how you doing? Thanks for joining. I love you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited that all of you guys are here in the chat today, just to reiterate that once again. And again, to those watching after the fact, really appreciate you too. So far, positive responses from everyone about the troop. My friend Kat, who I just said was here, she also read the troop because not only was this the book for my book club here for our YouTube channel, the Midnight Book Society Club, but it was also the pick for my personal book club that I run privately, and Kat's in that book club, so she read the troop for that book club with me. 
And she says for her, it was also a five star read. And yeah, we kind of discussed it a little bit. Our book club meeting about the troop was last week, last Thursday, to be precise. And it was just me, my friend Kat, who's here, and our friend Burke. And so Burke also gave it a high rating. He really liked it. I don't think he like rated it a number. He didn't give it like a four or a five. He just said he he liked it. <laughs> so that's good enough for me. Oh, thank you for joining. DJ has to go. Thank you anyway so much. And they gave it a four-star rating. And I think that's good. Ashley says five-star rating for her. And Ashley, I know it affected you. I would love for you to leave some comments about why the troop affected you so much, what you thought about it, because I know we've had some discussion on my Instagram. So drop your thoughts if you don't mind me sharing them. Because I know Ashley was like, I needed a break after I read the true, but I needed to read something else, like something different, something lighter. Because I will say, so yes, there's gross stuff. So there, There's different types of horror, as you guys know, if you're horror fiction fans. There are horror fiction books that are just balls to the wall. Pardon that expression, whatever. It's, you know, going 100 miles per hour. It's really crazy. It's really gory. But it's almost in a fun you're not that freaked out kind of way. There's the other kind of gross horror books that are more like emotional at the same time. So yes, it's got the gore factor and the grossness, which in some cases can be fun, as I just mentioned. But in these other cases, the emotional cases, they pack a punch and it isn't just like a good time. It's kind of like a pained time in a way. You can appreciate the gore and enjoy the gore, but at the same time, you might, uh, you know, relate to the characters and so that makes you feel a little bit more ben grimm is here and ben says the troop sounds awesome oh my gosh if you have not read it we are talking spoilers so just to warn you there it is awesome everyone here has given it a four four and a half or five so far no one has shouted out any lower ratings so far that i've seen or read here but i have seen my friend juan from plagued by visions juan did give this i think either a three was it even lower than a three? I know Juan gave it a little bit lesser of a rating. And actually, Cameron from Library Macabre, Cameron gave it, I think, a three star. And I read his review on Goodreads. Of course, I didn't do a lot of screen captures today. So I don't have his review screen captured that I could read to you guys. But I can pull it up on my phone. But he did not say why it was three. He did say it was gross and effective. And it freaked him out in a good way. But he didn't say, like, why... If that was in a good way, why then did he rate it only three versus four or five? So, I don't know. So, some people here are talking about The Deep, which is Nick Cutter's, one of his other books. And so, uh, I would like to check out The Deep. I've heard different things about it, but... Um, I really like the troop. I don't know if it's going to live up for me personally for the um, after the troop because I've I loved it. Ashley says the thing that got her about the troop was the kids going through all this horrible stuff. And that's what a lot of people feel, too. I think I think kids going through really tough things and really hard, like unimaginable things, I think really gets to people, especially parents or people who take care of people or people who have siblings, stuff like that. Me, I'm effed up. And like, yeah, it. It made me sad. I was connected to the characters, but at the same time, I was not, like, overly freaked out and affected after I was done to where I was like, I can't, you know, keep reading. I, I gotta, you know, take a break or anything. I don't know why it didn't affect me that way. I have discovered that something is happening to me with books and movies. Books, I'm almost getting desensitized to where nothing really phases me in terms of, oh, I can't read this. Maybe it started with the book, The Cows, or I'm sorry, it's just called Cows, No The. If you guys have read Cows, you know what I'm talking about. It's notorious for being one of the most disturbing and gross and disgusting books ever. So I read that and I was like, I can't believe I even got through that. So that was one thing that happened. And I was like, whatever. Then before the troop, before I read The Girl Next Door by Jack Ketchum in the same very month in March. So March was a heavy month, guys. Like, March was hardcore for me in terms of heavy reading. I should name the books that I read to you guys, and you guys would be like, what? If you know anything about the books I read, the titles themselves, you would know, damn, she read some heavy books. But for some reason, especially after The Girl Next Door, reading this, it was, like, easier, if that makes sense. Because The Girl Next Door was hardcore. But even The Girl Next Door wasn't as 
impactful to me as I thought. And I think it all has to do with because I, I read Let's Go Play at the Adamses like a year and a half ago. And that one prepared me for The Girl Next Door because they're different, but they're similar in a way. It's like if you can get through one, you can get through another. Now you can argue which one's more uh, maddening and which one's more emotional. You can argue that case you know, for one or the other, but they're both pretty hard to read. Same thing with this. It is hard to read. I'm not going to deny that fact. I just found that I could easily get, not easily, but I could, you know, put it aside. Once it was done, I was like, that was good. That was emotional, but I can like, you know, push it aside and go on with reading pretty easily. All right, let's see what other people are saying. Monster Blood, it did the gross out horror very well. It added to the sense of terror without it feeling like needless shock value. I agree with that. Exceedingly gory, yes, but in the best way possible. Hell yeah, Monster Blood. Hell yeah, I agree. Um, definitely, I didn't feel like it was over the top. And I'm going to talk about something else that is a criticism that some people say about the troop. Some people have pointed out the animal abuse parts of the book and said that those scenes were hard to read. I agree with with that that they are hard to read however some people were saying that it was unnecessarily unnecessary and that it was there just to be there i disagree with that completely i think every animal scene here had a reason to be there and we'll talk about that because we are going to get into specifics one more warning for those of you who might not have been here at the very beginning spoilers will be discussed and i'm going to put up my warning right now in case anyone's coming in and out as i'm chatting before I get into spoilers accidentally. So I'm gonna leave this up for a little while. I just want everyone to be warned. All right. Kelly said, with the ending, she likes the sort of social commentary that it had, if that makes sense. Yeah, there was like a social commentary at the end because I can't wait to dis dissect the ending with you guys. Like, oh my God, the ending. It's like, what does it mean? Because there are different ways that people have interpreted the ending. Like, does it mean that he is infected or is he not infected? And it's just like a metaphor and like some kind of symbolic message. So yeah, we'll get into that in a second because I've actually got stuff from Reddit that I pulled that I wanna read about what people think and different opinions. My book club was tied about the ending and we'll get into all of that. Kelly said, it was more scary because something of this nature could be possible. And she doesn't wanna say much more because of spoilers, but I'm, we're gonna get into spoilers. Everyone's been warned. We're, we're literally about to head into spoilers right now. All right, guys, so this is spoiler territory. So these freaking worms, oh my God, it is very possible. I mean, tapeworms exist, and these are like a mutated, like evolved tapeworm, essentially. So that in itself, like I've never really thought much about tapeworms. But the more I thought about it, I was like, well, I have a dog. And they're like, they're giving examples of how you can just get a worm from having a dog. And I was like, well, I have a dog. Like, what if I get worms or something? Like, and now I'm all freaked out about worms. So just the fact, like Kelly alluded to, that this is possible, that is pretty freaky when you sit there and think about it. And I'm like, oh, oh, hell no. Like, oh, hell no, this could really happen. Oh, Ashley, I'm going to come back to your comment about the end because I want to talk about the ending like like in one chunk. So I don't want to go like, you know, talk about the end and then jump around and then talk about the end again. I'm going to come back to your comment here about the ending. I think you've got a great take about the ending, which I will highlight in a little while. Justin, you can clarify what scene you're talking about, because I think there's a lot of those scenes in the book. So just as what Justin says, there is that scene from the troop that definitely phased me. I love that. I don't even have to specify beyond that. And people know what I'm talking about. I cried during that scene. I mean, I think if you're talking about like animal specific scenes, there's the turtle scene. Oh, there's the chimpanzee scene. Oh, hard to read. And I think the turtle scene had to be there because it was a direct and my friend Kat she kind of got me on this train of thought. So I've got to give credit to where credit is due. Kat, thank you for telling me about this idea and kind of, you know, making me think about this a little bit more. My friend Kat said she thought the turtle scene was necessary because we saw all the bad stuff with Shelly. And yeah, you could just say Shelly killed some spiders. Kelly, 
Shelly liked, not Kelly. Kelly, you don't like to kill animals. Shelly, it's a tongue twister. Shelly likes to kill spiders and Shelly likes to kill animals. You could just say that, but is it as effective as seeing the events of Shelly killing animals through his own mind, through his own disturbing, you know, crazy mind? No. It is not as effective as just saying that as a narrator. I think it's better that we're there, we're seeing him killing the kitten, and we're like, no, how could he do that? And the kitten that he kills, this character Shelly in the book we're talking about, again, this is spoilers, so you've been warned because it's right there. So the character of Shelly, the freaking cat was purring. The cat was all like, I love you. And then he's like, I don't care, bitch. I'm going to take you up to the bathtub and drown you. And it was his mom's cat. It was all very sad, but um, that is kind of the personality of a future sociopath and psychopath and killer. So to me, I don't know, there were people who complained that there weren't um, enough, there, that there wasn't enough character development. I disagree because I felt like each boy in the troop are, you know, main characters of the actual Boy Scout troop. I think all of them had distinct separate personalities. So that's character development right there. And you might argue one might possibly say that, you know, Shelly, it's kind of generic to have him have these traits of a ser serial killer about torturing animals. But isn't that a proven trait that kids who mess with animals grow up to be kind of sociopaths? I mean, it it's, it's stereotypical, but it's stereotypical because it's been proven to be real and like a thing and a trait that it, like pays out to be something bad and it plays out terribly for people who have that trait and for people who know that person as well. So anyway, I think it made sense, the whole him torturing animals, and then you get the scene with the turtle. They're trying to eat the turtle, you know, but the act of killing the turtle to eat him is just so hard for them to come to grips with that they can't even eat him. They can't even go through with eating him, so they just end up burying him. So it was all for naught. And I think that makes it that much more depressing. And I think right there is the perfect difference between the other boys and Shelly. And that's why you had to have that scene, because it shows that they were trying to do what they had to do, but they couldn't even do that. And they, they had too much humanity in them to even try to do whatever was necessary to survive. So I thought that was a very important scene. Kat says, the turtle scene was super sad, but I couldn't blame them because of their circumstances. What Max and Newt does is so different than what Shelly does. And that is very true. I will read this. So Monster Blood has a point, and this is what I was saying that people could say it's a criticism. Shelly's character being a psychopath was sort of a mixed bag for me. Am I the only one who felt he was a little bit shoehorned in to build extra suspense? We needed a character to steal the spark. Um, I understand that. Monster Blood, that didn't bother me personally, though, but I, I could see how someone might feel that way, like, oh, it just so happens they're trapped on an island with someone who's a sociopath. I, I understand what you mean. Like, what are the odds? One, what are the odds that these kids are freaking chosen? Not chosen, but they happen to be there when the military's like, yeah, let's do this, and let's run this. Technically, it's an accident, but it's really a test. Or at least that's what I understood it to be from, you know, reading between the lines and what was talked about uh, with the evidence laid in throughout the book. You guys can give your opinions on that as well if you want, but uh, I could see what you mean. I could see what you mean, Monster Blood, but but to me, the Shelly thing worked. I, maybe I'm just a freaking fiend for drama, because I, I it, obviously it did add to the drama, and it did make you like, oh, oh shit, because not only are you dealing with the the worms themselves, which is scary enough, which, yeah, you could have had the whole book just be about that, which is almost similar to like an animal attack type of thing. But I think the human element was, was very interesting to examine as well. But yeah, I could see how you could say it was technically shoehorned in there. All right. And Justin was referring to the, the turtle scene because it was so prolonged. So it's that scene. And like, that's the scene Justin cried about. And yeah, the turtle. Yeah, that scene was very sad. That was like heartbreaking. But also what was heartbreaking was a lot of different things. If you think about the book, there are so many heartbreaking scenes. Like um, Max at the end, he survives so much. And I'm barely going to talk about the end here because I want to dive into it further in a little while. But Max gets treated like a freaking leper it's so sad 
uh, he survives everything just to be treated that way and just to be alone in the end in a way. Not not physically alone, but basically metaphorically alone because nobody wants anything to do with him. So yeah, he's technically living with his parents and back with his family, but it's not like it used to be. His life before the island, before the incident with the worms, it's dead. It's gone. So it's almost like he did die on the island in a way because his former life is no more. And that to me is also sad and heart-wrenching, just like the turtle scene. And like, it's such a sad note to end on, especially if you go in even further and try to debate what the ending really means. Does it mean this or that? And we'll get there. I don't mean to keep saying that we're going to get there, but we are. Did I see Cameron here? Cameron. Hey, Cameron. How you doing? Thank you so much for being here. I want to know why you rated it three stars. I read your Goodreads review and you said it grossed you out and you had to take a break, but, but you didn't explain like why you deducted stars. Was it because it was hard to read? Was it because you didn't like the character development? Was it because like Monster Blood, you thought parts were shoehorned in? I just, I'm very curious to see why you rated it a three. And I think I'm remembering that it was a three, right? I don't want to misspeak about your right rating i'm gonna look it up right now all right yeah monster blood pointing out the scene with the chimp and that one was worse than the turtle for me even because at least there was some kind of empathy from the characters when the turtle stuff was going on they were pained while they were doing it just like we were pained reading it whereas the chimp scene there is a little emotion there with the secondary scientists but for the most part you're getting a very dry account of this chimpanzee freaking like just going like insane in a way but also like his body being like torn apart from the inside out and it's like really gross like that scene I, I think I even marked parts about that scene and I was like I can't this scene I can't all right it's somewhere here I'm gonna find it I will keep looking as I keep reading comments. All right, hold on. Here we go. Shelley was building up to killing someone. Animals were no longer as fulfilling to him. The isolation of the island and the sick man gave Shelley the opportunity to fulfill his desire. Yeah, definitely Shelley like took advantage. You know, he may not have killed someone for years, but being here, this opportunity, He's like, yeah. And not only does he kill someone physically with Kent, but I believe his name was Kent. That was like my least favorite kid character. I mean, Shelly was too, but Shelly and Kent, I did not like them at all. Kent was like too much of a smarmy know-it-all. I did not like that. But um, I... I felt so bad for Ephraim and the way he was manipulated by Shelly. That's almost just as bad, if not worse, than K Kent was already on the way out. Kent was already freaking suffering from having the worms inside of him. So Shelly killing him was terrible, but him taking advantage of Ephraim's fear, that was even worse in my opinion. And just, that was hard for me to read too. Honestly, that was almost harder than the turtle scene. Hearing about him tearing, like parts of himself off like that really got to me just that he was so far gone that he almost didn't even feel pain it was like the fear was numbing the pain that he should have felt while cutting himself like like talking about it makes me a little uncomfortable right now and the funny thing is i'm saying i'm desensitized to books but like talking about it after the fact, I'm getting all like, blah, blah, blah. but while I was reading it, I was like, whatevs, whatevs. Maybe I just can disassociate while reading it. But when I like go back and think, I'm like, yeah, that did affect me. But when I think about movies, for some reason, movies are affecting me so much more now for some reason than uh, books. And I, I don't know why that is. It's like, I never used to be that phased by movies. So it, it's like reversed now with me. And I don't know what's happening. Like stuff in movies that used to be okay. Like someone's getting cut. Like their hands all bleeding. Then I'm like, Ugh, I can't watch it anymore. And Paul's like, my boyfriend is like, what is wrong with you? Who are you? Why can't you watch this stuff anymore that you used to watch? I'm scrolling and scrolling, Cameron, and I can't find your review. I'll have to find it later. I could have sworn it was a three and that I saw it earlier, like uh, a week or two ago. Because I think I read it to my book club, actually. We've got Jamie joining us in the chat. Hey, Jamie, how you doing? So let's just dive into the ending. So again, guys, if you're just here, if you're new here, 
we are talking spoilers right now. Please be warned. This is the warning. Spoilers are ahead. Huge spoilers. It will ruin the whole book. So just, this is the big warning. Please, please, please. I don't want to ruin it for anyone. So if you've read it, stay and we'll talk about it. All right. So the end, let's dive into this. I'm excited about this. What does it mean? What do you guys think? Do you think he was infected or do you think it was symbolic at the end? I will read you what I'm talking about. The very last paragraph the very last paragraph. What does it mean? There are so many different like opinions on Reddit and also my book club. They're torn too. my other book club that read this book as well. Come on, page 50. Where are you? I mean, chapter 50, not page 50. Here it is. All right. One evening, Max borrowed his uncle's boat and piloted it towards Falstaff Island. His heart jogged faster as the island came into view, rising against the horizon like the hump of a breaching whale. It was charred black, nothing but the odd burnt tree spiking up from the earth. The water had the sterile sterile chlorine smell of a public pool it was the most desolate place he'd ever seen it echoed the desolation inside of him the emptiness the emptiness question mark max leaned both hands on the gunwale a nameless hunger was building inside of him it gnawed at his guts with teeth that called his name now rereading the page now there's one thing that i didn't notice the first time it says the emptiness dot dot dot. Then it says the emptiness question mark. Almost like the emptiness. It's like a morose, just symbolic emptiness. But then the second, the emptiness question mark makes me think he's infected because the emptiness question mark, like, am I empty? There's something inside me. That's almost what it seems to be indicating. I was debating with my book club, my other book club, like Kat, um, we were talking about like, does this mean he's infected? There are hints throughout the book where people said that the worms became very adaptable, where they could adapt to all kinds of situations. And there's examples that people on Reddit use to say that they think that in the end, Max is infected. It's not just symbolic emptiness. It's like, he's not empty anymore. There are bugs inside of him. So I thought perhaps you could read that as, you know, he's uh, thinking about his his past life, how nothing will ever be the same again. And so here, Cameron says, I think he felt so alone. And like you said, his soul died on the island. So he went back so haunting. That final paragraph, it's what stuck with it's what has stuck with me. I can talk. I very much can talk. <laughs> I don't know. It's up for debate right now. I did quickly exercise and like shove a hamburger <laughs> like down my throat right before this. I was like, <laughs> which might not be the best thing right before we're talking about worms and these crazy freaking things that like want you to eat whatever you can really quickly. So that it's a weird thing to do before coming on and talking about this book. But I had to eat quickly so that I wouldn't miss the stream. But I want to read you guys what the people on Reddit think because there were some really great things. Because as soon as I was done in the book, I was like, this is not really completely clear. Like, is he infected? No doubt. Or is this just some kind of metaphor? So right away, I Googled the troop ending and I wanted to see what other people were saying right away. So someone said, maybe I'm just an optimist, but I read it as a metaphor, kind of. A hunger for answers that he can find at the island. I don't think it's the parasite because they did a bunch of tests on him and he was fine. Some people in my other book club, they said the same thing. Oh, it's just, you know, it's just him feeling like hungry for his past. It's him longing for the way things used to be. And like, you know, uh, metaphorical hunger. So someone said, just finished the novel. I agree with your analysis. Definitely a symbolic or metaphorical ending about his depression or PTSD and how life will never be the same. I can see it that way. But as I just read it, now I'm starting to think of it a different way um, as I reread it again. Somebody said, yeah, I would be pretty upset if he was going to die after surviving everything he did on that island. I mean, yeah, hell, Max would be upset after all of that just to succumb to the virus. Someone else replied, I read it as he metaphorically didn't escape the island either, and his life ended there. While he didn't die due to the infection, he is scarred beyond repair. People don't trust him, are revolted by him, and no one will ever understand what he went through. An unhappy, unfulfilled life life eaten away. Yeah, that's, that's sad. 
or unfilled, I'm sorry, not unfulfilled, a ha unhappy, unfilled life eaten away. But some other people had a different take on it, that he is infected. So this person says, there was a comment a few chapters back about the military not being sure if it could be airborne because of how adaptable the parasite was. I interpreted it as maybe it, I'm going to say this wrong, aer aerosolized. I know that's wrong. Because of the napalm strikes, possibly the fire caused the extremely filled cave of eggs and whatnot to bust and go into the air. So when he got close to the island, he got infected from the smell. That's just how I read it, though. Someone else said, I agree. This is how I interpreted it. There were a few passages explaining that everyone thought cockroaches would be the ones to survive a nuclear holocaust, but it would instead be the worm. The book also hints that it could be airborne. I think Max inhaled the smoke drifting off the island and got infected. So, and another person agrees with these other people. I read it as he was infected, like the parasite had evolved again, able to stay dormant in bodies now and potentially even evade or fool the tests people were running to detect it. Now, I don't know about in like evading tests. To me, that's like, how does uh, something evolve to not show up? on tests like i mean i guess and i guess it could i mean science is crazy and complex how did we wind up the way we are you know it's very complex you know i guess anything is possible with evolution and all of that but i don't i just don't know on the other hand i can see the logic in that perhaps it became airborne and max got close that one night and so maybe being so close to the island he sucked in something he wasn't supposed to however you're gonna tell me that nobody else in this time because we're talking about months and months after the incident has happened you're telling me nobody else has gotten close to the island wouldn't we already know that there's a potential to be infected just by being near it if that was the case i mean a ship going semi nearby wouldn't that have occurred within that time frame so this is where i don't know what to think I could technically see it being in the air, but at the same time, wouldn't there have been another instance of someone else discovering that, yep, oh, it's it's there on the island still, it's around there, you can get infected, don't go near there. So to me, it's like, it's still hard to interpret it, even after just rereading you guys the last passage, even after reading all these great examples. I think there's a really strong case for both ways that it could have ended. Shout out what you guys think. What do you guys think? Um, I really love the ending. Cameron says, it's been a while since I read this. I remember liking it, but I'm not big on survival stories. I can get bored with the tropes, but this also had enough besides the survival aspects that stuck with me. Yeah, I do agree with the survival aspects. Uh, you know, they could, I could see, but, you know, get tiring. But I personally love this book. I thought, you know, I will say I haven't read, you know, people compare this to like Lord of the Flies. I haven't read that. So, you know, maybe I'm just not tired of the tropes yet. But this felt really different to me. Um, it felt awesome. And I liked how the, there was so much graphic detail. I felt like that was a, a great part of the book because it, it was like an emotional book, but sick at the same time and gross and like, I don't know if I want to read this type of thing. Um, in fact, somebody in our book club, she's not a super horror reader. Um, my friend Kat and I, it's our good friend, Michelle, she tried to read it. She checked it up from the library and she's like, eh, eh. She, she's like, I'm out. I think she was like, got like a chapter or two in and she's like, I'm out. <laughs> so the grossness already, she's like, I can't, I can't do it. So it's not for everybody. That's for sure. But uh, I really liked it. All right. Sorry. I'm just looking at other little examples is it my last reddit thing yeah so again i want to know what you guys think do you think he was infected monster blood said i liked the ambiguous ending as well my take on it is that he's not infected but what cameron said like you know being alone that he died on the island that's kind of how at first i was interpreting it as now again that is sad but personally, I don't think it's as sad if he had gone back and got infected. To me, that's like everything's for naught. But in this, in a way, everything's still for naught anyway because his whole life is destroyed. He's never going to have the type of life he would have had had that stuff on the island not occurred. So a very, very terrible situation for poor Max. So it's not a happy ending. You know, he doesn't get to just go back and be happy to be alive and to get through the ordeal. 
it's almost like just a very morose, sad ending. Uh, very sad. But I liked it. I mean, I loved the ending. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, against sad books or, you know, unhappy endings. Sometimes that's okay with me. Other times, like, I watch um, that movie Nobody, uh, that action movie with the actor from Better Call Saul, who I really like a lot. So we watched that last night, and I was like, oh my god, oh my god. I kept thinking something bad was going to happen, and it was more of, like, a light, action-y, nothing really too terrible happens. So it's like, sometimes I, I like that too, where it's in, in a story, nothing bad happens. Whereas other times I'm like, it's sometimes more deep if something sad does happen and you're left, you know, to interpret things the way you would, you know, you would, only you could decide. And also just, even if the ending is definite, sometimes it just, it's powerful. It's impactful. You know, it doesn't always need to be happy. Happy endings aren't always impactful. They're just like, uh, that was kind of a neat wrapped up ending. So it's not always good to end a story that way, in my opinion. Jamie says, definitely a metaphor for his trauma and loneliness, I still think. I. Kat said she liked the movie Nobody. So you saw it too. Yeah, I really loved that movie. It was great. This is a good comment here, and I agree with this. And this is what I'm talking about. This, See, everything I try to say, Cameron says it so much more <laughs> eloquently. He's just like, uh, let me like tell, take what you're trying to say and just make it really nice. Because I'm an author, bitch. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you are. <laughs> and I mean that as a compliment, of course, Cameron. Cameron says, happy endings don't stay with me. Sad endings haunt me. And yes, that's very well said. And I agree, 100%. <laughs> you, should, uh, you should use that, Cameron. I'm an author, bitch. <laughs> then people would think you're me, you know. You don't really say bitch like I do. <laughs> I just say it all the time for no reason at all. So sorry, guys. That's my thing. I don't know why I do it. It started because of Paul, my boyfriend. I blame him. All right, so I've got some passages marked. Do you guys have a favorite scene? I know we talked about the saddest scene, the turtle and the end, uh, but, you know, do you guys have a favorite scene? Like, I, I personally liked, this is a lighter part in the book, but I thought it was kind of a foreboding part of the book. Let me find it. <laughs> I feel like I'm about to cough, so if I do, I'm sorry. I will mute my mic real quick if I do, and I feel like I'm about to, so yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry. It's all this talk about worms. It's a part about zombies. Where is it? Which, in a way, the way people are affected reminds me of zombies, in a, in a way. Of course, I'm not going to be able to find it. I'll essentially tell you the scene. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Haha. -ha, I marked it with, like, a like I wrote on it um, on my little tab. So it says... It's talking about what Max and Ephraim, because they're best friends, what they used to talk about and argue about and, you know, just kid stuff, best friend stuff. They would talk about all kinds of things, like who would win in a fight, a zombie or a shark? A zombie, F said. Of course, it's already dead, right? It's not going to be scared of, hey, what kind of shark? A sandy? A white tip? I could win against a sandy. Max shook his head. Great white. Biggest badass in the ocean. Poofed. <laughs> F said. Killer whales got it all over great whites. But anyway, I still say zombie. If it gets one bite in, it wins. The shark's a zombie. Who says sharks turn into zombies? Everything turns into a zombie, Maximilian. Whatever, I say shark. You know how thick shark skin is. And it goes on and on. But I like how this line, to me, felt foreboding. Everything turns into a zombie. And as I said, when, when people get infected with these worms, they don't they're they cease to be themselves they are not themselves anymore like a zombie a zombie is kind of mindless eaters in a way they they hunger for brains they're just like yo we're going out here we don't care uh, and then they just want to eat people and flesh and stuff as well whereas the same thing i think with these people who are infected with the worms they're just like uh everything turns into a zombie to me that line stuck out i was like oh my god this is going to be an important, I just knew it was going to be an important line in the book, at least to me. So that scene, for some reason, I really liked, and I love sharks, by the way. If you guys didn't know, sharks are my favorite animal. Would I go into a shark uh, cage in the ocean? Yeah, I mean, I'd be scared. And the thing is, the thing that's the scariest part is, um, when you go into the ocean with a shark, they have the sense to, like, they could hear your heartbeat. 
waves, bitch, like like ultrasonic waves and stuff. They can hear that. That that would freak me out. But um, I really like sharks quite a bit. And the funny thing is, so they mention they mention killer whales or orcas, and uh, yeah, I just watched Free Willy what, last night. So by the way. Killer whales are not whales. They're actually part of the dolphin family. But I always, even though I had a two-hour chat about Free Willy where I said, they're not whales, you know, <laughs> they're not technically whales. I was I was calling them whales the whole time. And I was like, what am I doing? I just said that they were not whales. But I, I kept meaning to say killer whales and I just left the killer art part off of it so yes orcas are actually like in the the dolphin family at least i remember that from my research when i did this whole free willy stream free willy still holds up not to get on a sidebar but we we do sidebars here if you guys are new to the book club you might not know but i'm letting you know now we do sidebars like in one of our streams we talked about our favorite ways to eat a hot dog but to be fair it was related to the book a little bit in a way so I really liked the whole discussion of that. I thought it was fun, but at the same time, I think it had a bigger meaning. And that's just my interpretation. I could be wrong. I don't know what you guys think about that. But uh, start, you know, uh, shouting out your favorite scenes in the book, if you can remember. Sad scenes, impactful scenes, gross scenes. Like if there's a particularly gross scene, shout out whatever. I want to hear what you guys loved about the book or, you know, didn't like as well if you didn't really love it. Kat says, yeah, sad endings definitely stick with you. I totally agree. And they stick with Kat, too, she says. She she thinks sad endings really get with stick with her and get to her. Oh, this is a see, this is an interesting comment. Ashley said she thought it was a zombie book before the parasite showed up. See, I knew about the parasite. I knew a little bit about the book going into it. And so I felt like that sentence was going to have a bigger meaning but that's so cool and funny how there's that zombie reference and you thought it might turn out to be a zombie book which it could have i mean they could have you know turned and could have just been a basic infection that kind of turned them into zombie like people i do love i think a really heavy message in the book and a strong underlying theme in the book throughout the whole book is adults don't have all the answers. I don't know if you guys read it that way, but I feel like there are a lot of passages talking about kids, you know, feeling free to go and join, enjoy themselves because the adults will take care of the thing that's scary. The adults will take care of the adult things while the kids are free to be kids. But as we keep going on, we learn that it's not that way, that adults don't know all the time what is right and what is the best thing and sometimes adults will tell you how to be and what to do and yet they're hypocritical because they are not even sure how to be and how to act and they're not even doing the things that they're telling the kids to do so to me i thought that was so interesting at least three or four times this is talked about in the book the kids talk about the difference between adults and kids and how adults are supposed to to know what's right and supposed to be in charge and I mean, there's a really poignant part at the end about that, but uh, I'm sure I can find it. I marked the parts I liked. And here, you know, Kent, part of why I didn't like Kent is because, I mean, I can't blame him in a way because he had like a very, I guess, a domineering dad. Like his dad was super in his face, like, you should be this way. This is how a man is. Almost like a little too much like that. His His dad wasn't the best influence for him, but... So that obviously had an effect on Kent, the character, one of the little kids. But, I mean, so in a way I can understand why his respect for adults kept, you know, getting chipped away and chipped away. But at the same time, I hated his disrespect and his willingness to just throw the scoutmaster under, you know, under the bridge. Like, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just not even worry about him. Throw him in the closet. He didn't even care. He was ready. And, you know, his ego is what got him into trouble. His ego, oh, we locked up the scoutmaster in the closet. Let me take a sip of this adult alcohol. And that is where the worms are. Wasn't very smart, was it, bitch? No, <laughs> it wasn't smart at all. So um, it says Ken's respect had trickled away by degrees. Why should he respect adults? Because they were older? Why, if that age hadn't come with wi wisdom? Kent came to see that adults required the same stern hand that his peers did. He was their equal, their better in many ways. So it's just like he was very conceited, but I could see how, especially, you know, as the story progresses, their faith in adults just get chipped away. I mean, they don't have all the answers and that becomes clear. I, I, I definitely thought that was a huge theme in the book, more than just, you know, 
what people would do to survive, how things, you know, devolve in a crisis. I think it was much more than that. Jamie agrees. Definitely got the message that adults do not have all the answers, always question authority. Yeah, it, it almost felt like that. Oh, and there was a great part where they described um, the loss of color in someone's face. And this reminds me of old school April um, coming up because they referred to Ices. Uh, they were saying that uh, somebody's face looked like the bottom of a Slurpee where all the um, the flavoring and the juice was sucked out and you just had the uh, the kind of discolored ice. But it was said a lot more eloquently than that. I was like, what a great comparison. Yeah, here it is. The man looked worse in the lamplight. His skin washed of pigment. Tim's mind conjured a weird image. The last few sips at the bottom of a Slurpee cup. The color all sucked out. Only the tasteless ice crystals left. I was like, that is such a great comparison. And Slurpees, which I really considered, consider them Icy's, that reminds me of being a kid in the 90s. So I used to get Icy's every Thursday night. Today is Thursday. So um, Thursday nights, growing up as a kid in the 90s, it was pizza night. And it was ER night because my family, my cousin Dana, my aunt Jackie, my mom and I, we would all get together and we would watch the new episode of ER, the medical show, which I loved growing up. And I loved it in college, too. I bought it all on DVD and rewatched it all a lot. By the way, Michael Crich Michael Crich Michael Crichton, the author, I can never say his last name right, the author of Jurassic Park, uh, he actually co-wrote, I think he actually wrote it by himself. But he co-produced the pilot of ER with Steven Spielberg. It was their project together before Jurassic Park. But um, he wrote the script of the pilot of ER. Because I think he was uh, either he went to medical school or he actually became a doctor. I know he was at least in medical school. So he knew about like that lifestyle and stuff. So yes, a lot of people don't know. He wrote the pilot for ER and he came up with the whole concept, which I think is pretty genius and amazing. And I do think it's like, the best medical drama ever made. There's not been a great, 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 great one ever since, in my opinion. There's good ones, but like ER set the standard, in my opinion. So Thursday nights, ER, ICs, I guess you could call them similar to Slurpees, as well as um, we would go to the gas station. I would get chiclets. Hell yeah. The green chiclets. And uh, we would just hang out. My dad would uh, have a poker night. So my dad would be doing poker. We'd be in our room watching ER. Everyone would have pizza. We'd have our ices. It was a great night. Thursday nights growing up in the 90s were amazing. I don't know if you had any traditions like that, you guys, in the 90s, but but I definitely did. And that was one of them. And so, yes, tonight is a Thursday night, and we're about to kick off with Old School April, which is all about 90s, 80s, 70s stuff and feeling old school. So I feel like it's a good time to mention all of that. But, yeah, the Slurpee comparison was genius. Such a great way to say that someone, like, lost all their color in their face. But it was just a really cool way of saying that. That was more elaborate. <coughs> oh, yeah, this is a good comment. Here I go again. Monster Blood. That scene with Max and Newt on the boat at the end was horribly tragic. Yes, but okay, we get the hint. Did you guys like this or dis dislike this? There was a scene in the book where they gave some piece of evidence that said that there was only one survivor. And this was like, I guess, three-fourths into the book. So at this point, we know, okay, only one kid survives. I guessed it was going to be Max. Because I knew that Newt was too good to survive. He was too uh, pure to survive, if that makes sense. I just had a feeling it wouldn't be him because it's easy to root for Newt. Newt was the most, you know, black and white of the characters in terms of like, you know, you felt the worst for Newt, poor Newt. It was always getting picked on, but he had a good heart and he cared about everybody. And not that Max wasn't a good kid deep down and even Ephraim too, even though he had a temper, I, I still think Ephraim was a great kid too, deep down. And he tried, you know, but, um, now, obviously, Shelly was not, and Kent was questionable, but otherwise, the other kids, you know, I was rooting for any of those, Ephraim, Newt, or Max, but Newt was just the easiest to root for, and yeah, I just knew then that once they said there's one survivor, I'm like, well, it's not Newt then, so already I was like, and Ephraim's already losing it, so it's not Ephraim, and so I figured it would be Max, so I don't know if you guys like that, if it ruined who would survive, or if anybody would survive or not, would you rather have not had that in there, not introduced at all. I want to hear your opinions on that. But me, 
I didn't mind it so much, but at the same time, when um, Monster Blood is referring to the scene on the boat, he's referring to, and this is big spoilers again, Newt gets shot. And, you know, yes, that is terribly sad and tragic and horrible, but I had a feeling that that would happen because we already knew that Newt was infected once he got on the boat. And as they're making their way on, like, you know, to towards the other boats, I was like, there's no way they're going to even let Newt close to them. And so what's surprising is that they let Max, after having been so close to Newt, still come on the boat. Uh, that was what was surprising. But I didn't really get that uh, that much surprise feeling from Newt getting shot. However, I was very sad about it. Yes, it was very heart-wrenching. A terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, and it sucks because he was a great, great character. And speaking of that, Kat says, Newt was my favorite scout. I also like the Scoutmaster as well. Yeah, the Scoutmaster had good intentions. Um, but wanting to save that guy really was the downfall of everything. However, we kind of know as we go through the book and there was going to be this guy unleashed on this island anyway, they were kind of screwed no matter what. Even if the Scoutmaster had managed to stay away, obviously nobody was coming to rescue the kids. And even if the Scoutmaster had survived, they weren't coming to help them. So it is what it is. The thing that I don't understand is, so they say, okay, nobody's going to the island and nothing leaves the island. That was the whole military guy's, you know, reasoning behind everything about not rescuing the kids. But he's okay with letting them come near the boat. Like, we're not going to go get them, but if, if they happen to come, they fix this boat motor and they come to us, we'll, we'll take them if they're not infected. If they don't say one of the trigger words, we'll take them. That's what I didn't get. So all they had to do was fix the boat. I mean, what's the difference between letting the kid get near the boat and then pick him up versus going to see if they're okay with suits on? Like, why couldn't they have, you know, heavy-duty suits that would protect people from infection and go and check to see who was well and who was not? I mean, I get that the whole point was they were doing an experiment, but it still didn't add up to me. Like, his whole thinking, and I was like, that doesn't even seem like it would be a real rationale. Even if they were trying to do a, an on-purpose experiment, it didn't seem like it was thought out well enough. Um, obviously, we knew they were shady characters and they had bad intentions to conduct experiments and use this as a weapon. But even so, then why did they even let Max and the other kid approach? And if they did want Max for study, because I'm assuming the whole reason they let Max leave is to study if they were able to get the virus, you know, not, you know, if he, they were... They were <laughs> I can't speak. I guess they wanted to study to make sure that they could have somebody survive who was kind of nearby, but was not infected. And to see, you know, if that would remain the case. So I understand letting Max live, but like, you know, why even let them approach? If you were going to let them live to begin with, just go and see what was up at the island themselves. Go towards the island. So anyway, that's why when, at first I thought them getting the the motors back from the cave was, you know... I thought that was irrelevant. I was like, well, someone's going to come eventually, right? I was thinking, don't go back in that cave with the Shelly thing. That part was scary, the Shelly thing. Yeah, the Shelly thing was really crazy. Kat says the government didn't want the military to interfere with the experiment, so that is why nobody was allowed to go to the island. I guess that would be kind of encroaching on the test site versus when the kids leave the site. I guess that would make it okay for you know, to stop the experiment, essentially. Maybe it had to do with, you know, the actual island, being on the island versus they were in a boat off the island, so the military was like, okay, we can interfere now. Maybe that that's the way you could explain it. Good point, Kat. Good point. Jamie says, some people say the troop is very reminiscent of a book called The Ruins by Scott Thomas. Uh, I would be interested in reading that book as well to compare. I actually have heard that as well, but I heard The Ruins is a little more drawn out. Am I wrong? Who has read The Ruins here? Um, I know it's a very popular book. I have not read it yet, but I, I'm, I'm intrigued by it for sure. I don't know. It would have to do a lot for me to like it as much as I like the troop. I know Kat thought this was scary because we talked about this together. Kat said the Shelly thing was the scariest part. Like, I know, it almost describes Shelly at the end like like a spider creature. Like, you know, I, I imagined his limbs all twisted. This makes me look like Artie. The strongest man in the world! No, the Shelly thing. The twisted, the twistiest kid in the world! Ugh, gross. I did not like the Shelly thing.
I like the quote that one of the characters mentioned that the island was like a giant petri dish. That's a good. That's a good pointed. Uh, a good pointed out statement from the book. Why can't I talk today? I'm so sorry. I, this is like the worst review ever. People are like, Kelsey's book club is trash. She can't even speak. I hope you don't think that. It's I blame it on the fastly eaten burgers. Kelly says, the end was scary considering people could use this during war. They sacrifice innocent people in order to research on how well they can kill others. Says a lot about humanity, in my opinion. And yes, I agree with I agree with you, Kelly. I think that is a big part of the novel is that not only can you not tr trust like the government in some ways, authority in some ways, but things are just very sad and hopeless, kind of. You know, they're... It's almost like hopelessness in humanity, hopelessness in your fellow man. It's just very, it is very sad. I will say it is a very grim book, I think, but I think it was effective. I think books that make you feel, I think, are the most effective books. And this book does make you feel a lot of things, whether that's anger at the animal abuse or, you know, grossed out, feeling grossed out by the, you know, really gory parts it makes you feel different things. And I think that's why I loved the troop personally. I don't know about you guys, but yeah, I freaking loved it. Justin says the ruins. It's very good. Well, I definitely, definitely want to read that one day. Monster blood also wants to read the ruins. Jamie says the troop definitely did not restore her face, her faith in humanity. <laughs> Speak. I don't even know. Um, I think one of the saddest parts is, you know, I mean, there are a lot of sad parts, as I said, but we get near the end and it's Max and he says, do you know how hard it is to kill something? Nothing wants to die. Things cling to their lives against all hope, even when it's hopeless. It's like the end is always there. You can't escape it, but things try so, so hard not to cross that finish line. So when they finally do, everything's been stripped away. Their bodies and happiness and hope. Things just don't know when to die. I wish they did. I wish my friends had known that. Sort of, anyway. But I'm glad they tried. That's the part of being human, right? Part of any living thing. You hold on to life until it gets ripped away from you. Even if it gets ripped away in pieces, you just hold on. And I think, I really think that this passage here is symbolic of the entire meaning of the entire book. Honestly, like you could sum up everything the book is about with this one paragraph right here. How how hard is it for things to die? Things don't just die. You know, you could see that with people who were infected with the parasite. They kept struggling to live and live. So yeah, that's kind of like a upfront statement right that there. You could take it as, you know, factual, very uh, literal statement right there but metaphorically things don't want to die either i think it's like you you have to keep hope alive you don't want to give up hope uh, a hope not just in living but a hope in everything that exists around you a hope in you know things being good so i think it's about that as well at least that's what i read this passage like uh, this is such a great passage this one little part by the survivor max it just like sums up everything in my opinion it's it's just such a great part right there oh yeah that isn't uh, i think little heaven is uh there's an ex so kelly is mentioning that nick cutter wrote a book about cults which i really want to do a, like a mini cult readathon uh later in the summer she's saying he's got like a cult book called little heaven and they they do uh show you an excerpt from that book at the end of my version of the troops so here's little heaven i didn't read the excerpt yet because i thought once I heard it was about cults, I was like, well, I'm not going to read the excerpt because I might just read it for my, you know, summer months or something. Kelly's like, just throwing it out there. She's got an ulterior motive because I know she likes cult books and so do I. Courtney says, and this is a good point. This is a good point here. Courtney, uh, I think they mostly let Max live for publicity. Kind of like, hey, we messed up this experiment and let out a potentially internationally devastating worm, but we did save this one kid. So yeah, it was almost like damage control because they knew that this incident would get out. But hey, at least somebody survived, right? So I guess that is a way to interpret it as well. 
And that's a reason why they let Max live. Not just to experiment on him, but to say, like, well, you know, we saved somebody. I think that's a great point. And yes, back to the Shelly thing. Kat said, I couldn't stand the flare going in and out, being in the dark with Shelly, knowing he was mutating and psycho. Like, yes, yes, Kat, yes. Like, oh my God, that was scary. I like that. I was reading it so fast because it was almost like you were watching a movie where you were like, come on, come on, get out of that cave. In fact, when he started to go in the cave, I'm like, what are you doing, Max? Don't go back there. Because at that point, obviously, I didn't know. I didn't know the, what the end would be or how they would get rescued. I didn't think there was any option of them leaving with the boat. So I was like, you don't need those motors. They'll eventually come back for you. I guess, I, you know, Max had the right idea. He had to make the escape happen himself or they wouldn't have come for him, apparently. But, you know, I was sitting there being like, don't go in the cave, Max. Just forget about the freaking spark plugs or whatever they are. Yeah, I was like, don't go back there. And Kat, that flare part got me too. It was very nerve wracking and stressful and tense to read that part. And very well done. Very well executed by Nick Cutter. Jamie says, yeah, let's read that Nick Cutter book next, uh, the Little Heaven one, the Colt one. Yeah, I'm definitely wanting to read that one. Maybe in the summertime when I'm doing my little mini Colt, it'll be like a half Colt, half summer camp, you know, horror book thing. I, I'm thinking August. I'm also doing Cujo in August, which doesn't match with either of those things, but it's summery, so it fits in just because it's summery. So yeah, I'm thinking August, I'll be doing Colts and also summer camp stuff as well so I, I think anyone who wants to join in it'll be nothing with prompts or anything just like a loose theme there was one more quote that i wanted to oh this one um i like how they were talking about how kids and adults can deal with different things without losing their mind, without going crazy. And I thought this this was a great scene in the book, or at least a great passages. Page 272 in my version, which is like the Blue Island version. Sorry if you can hear dishes. I could hear dishes are being clanked in the other room. So I am sorry if you can hear that. How had Max kept that crushing fear at bay? He didn't really know. Maybe that was the trick. Maybe it was that he'd found a way to bleed it away in the quiet moments, breathing deep, feeling it slipping from him in almost imperceptible degrees. Maybe Newton had his own strategies, or maybe it wasn't anything you could strategize. It came down to that flexibility of a person's mind and an ability to withstand horrors and snap back like a fresh elastic band. A flinty mind shattered. In this way, he was glad not to be an adult. A grown-up's mind, even one belonging to a decent man like Scoutmaster Tim, lacked that elasticity. The world had been robbed of all its mysteries, and with those mysteries went the horror. Adults didn't believe in old wives' tales. You didn't see adults stepping over sidewalk cracks out of fear that they might somehow, some way, break their mother's backs. They didn't wish on stars, not with the squinty-eyed fierceness of kids anyway. You'll never find an adult who believes that saying Bloody Mary three times in front of a mirror and in a dark room will summon a dark, blood-hungry entity. Adults were scared of different things, their jobs, their mortgages, whether they hung out with the right people, whether they would die unloved. These were pallid compared to the fears of a child, leering clowns under the bed and slimy monsters capering above the basement's light and faceless sucking horrors from beyond the stars. There's no stuff there's no 12-step or self-help group for dealing with those fears. Or maybe there is. You just grow up. And when you do, you surrender your nimbleness of mind required to believe in such things, but also to cope with them. And so when adults find themselves in a situation where the, that nimbleness is needed, well, they can't summon it. So they fall to pieces, go insane, panic, suffer heart attacks, and aneurysms brought on by fright. Why? They simply don't believe it could be happening. That's what's, that's what's different about kids. They believe everything can happen and fully expect it to. I thought that this was like genius. Like this whole page. Like that was almost like a page of stuff I read you. That was so well written. I love that idea. And, and even there's even more good stuff. Like Max knew he was at the age where disbelief began to set in. The erosion was constant. Santa Claus had gone first. Then the monster in the closet. Soon he believed the way his folks did. Rationally. 
but for now, he still believed enough, and maybe that had kept him sane. He was idly working all of this over in his mind when the scream started. Just, oh, that is, like, that is great writing there. Like, so to me, it's like, this is a five star, like, that one page. Like, just the passages I've read to you guys, I'm, like, remembering, and I only read this, a, like, a week or two ago. I'm just remembering how wonderful it is, and I don't know. Again, I did see my friend Juan, just to reiterate, say that he thought that there was a lack of character development, but I just did not find that to be the case. But if you guys found that to be the case, please, I want to hear from you and why. I love having a back and forth discussion. I think it's perfectly fine to disagree and have different opinions about books and movies and everything in life, as long as we do so with respect and we hear the other person's reasonings out. And we can have a discussion and a back and forth about it um, and kind of, you know, dive into the analysis of it. Like, why do we each think different things? I think that's wonderful. So guys, uh, if you thought differently, if you didn't like the character development, if you thought it was weak, let me know. Shout it out and explain why. And we'll dig into that. But me, I love the characters. I thought it was also a thrilling read overall. And even more than all of that, I just thought it was extremely, wonderfully well-written. You know, there was the parts that were really deep, and there were other parts that were just really sick. <laughs> and I liked both. And I liked how they somehow worked so flawlessly and fluidly together. It like, just like, you know, it was swimming between gross, sick, and also like, whoa, that's like mind blowing. That's such a concept. Oh, that's like deep. That's metaphorical. That's um, just so thought provoking. So I just think Nick Cutter did a really wonderful job at weaving in both elements, the grossness, but also I don't know, the philosophicalness, if that makes sense. Kat thought the characters were well-developed. I do, I like I said, Shelly could technically be a stereotype, but to me, the reason it's a stereotype is because they've proven that kids who kill animals do wind up being psychopaths. But, I mean, it's not always the case, but it's been done in study. So I guess that's why it is kind of stereotypical. It could be thought of that way. But I understand what you mean, Monster Blood. I thought the character development was good, but some of them fell into stereotypes, which can be a bit off-putting. Yeah, I could see what you mean. So yes, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up in a little while, guys. I just want to make sure that everyone got their thoughts out there. Everyone got to say what they thought about the book. Uh, any final last words, guys? Any final thoughts? I've got... Uh, Bailey's with my name on it after this. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited about that. What are you guys reading before? I like to like kind of just talk about, you know, general stuff too before I sign off. What are you guys reading? Are you finishing up anything for March? Or are you moving on to April reads? Are you taking off tonight from reading? Uh, I want to hear about it. Me, I am trying to finish up. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Hold on. I'll, I'll show it to you. Oh, geez. My shorts are short. <laughs> I didn't know they were shown. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So I'm reading The Rats by James Herbert. This is a terrible copy. Look how freaking faded it is. But it's still cool. Uh, it's like this dude's barely seen face with like blood a little bit on it. And there's just blackness around it. It would be cooler if it was like a swarm of rats. But there's just one rat. Where are you? Right here. So I'm reading this. I'm about... 114 pages in. It's only 204 pages. I'm hoping to read the other pages tonight, finish it tonight, because tomorrow, clean slate, I'm starting all of my old school reads. I'm hoping you guys want to join in on old school April. Hopefully you guys have your TBRs planned if you're joining in, or if you don't want to read, there's a big watch list uh, event going on as well, along with the readathon. And anyone is welcome to do one, the other, or both, or neither if you're not into it, that's fine. But it's not just, you know, adult vintage horror. It's also um, vintage middle grade and vintage YA. So I'm so excited because I've got a little bit of everything on my April TBR. I've got vintage YA, vintage middle grade, and vintage adult horror. And so it's going to be a freaking old school blast. So I'm very pumped up about it. Ashley is starting her big list of April reads, currently reading Ritual. Also, Kat is reading the book I gave her, Slasher Girls and Monster Boys. I gave her my copy of that book. So yay, Kat, hopefully you could finish it to get your points. I know you're trying to get your AR points. 
Oh, Monster Blood is going to start reading the Dark Half soon. You're joining in on the Dark Half. Cat, look! The Dark Half! So Cat's the person I do my Stephen King project with, and our read for April is the Dark Half. And by the way, guys, if you're doing my readathon, the Dark Half fits in. It's an 80s horror book, and one of the prompts, if you're doing my prompts, you don't have to do the prompts. You could just read old stuff, any old stuff, and it counts as you know, participating in the readathon. But if you want to do the prompts, one of the prompts says, read an 80s horror book. Dark Half was published in 1989, the year I was born. And so it counts as an 80s book. And the movie was released, I believe, I think it was in the 90s. So that also counts as a 90s horror movie you could watch if you're doing the watchathon prompts. Or you could do, there's like a space where it's just like a mood read or watch and like anything could fit there from any year. That's as long as it's from 2002 or earlier. So yes, I'm so happy you're joining in on the dark half. I'm very, very happy. I know Kat is too. And Kat's starting the dark half tomorrow. Ooh, this is a book I want to read. Justin is reading Kin by Keelan Patrick Burke. I want to read that as well. Then also, Justin will be reading The Shining Girls before the TV adaptation starts soon. Oh, cool. I definitely want to read Kin. Do I own it? I do. I'm looking at it. I thought I owned it. I was like, I, I knew it sounded like super familiar as if I've had it on my book cart and stared at it many times before and just have not read it yet. Oh my God, Jamie, this is exciting. You're trying to finish up Fellowship of the Rings. I, uh, I want to read Lord of the Rings, all of the books, next year. I'm hoping. We'll see. It's, like, a big undertaking for me, but I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings movies, so I'd love to read the books, and it would kind of help me not just read horror all the time, because all I'm reading is horror, and I love horror, but at the same time, I do want to try to be diverse in my reading, and I'm totally not being that way in the last two years, but that's okay. I'm enjoying everything I'm reading, like, a lot. So I'm not complaining. And uh, Jamie brings up The Girl Next Door, which I also mentioned earlier in the stream. The Girl Next Door by Jack Ketchum. Super hard novel to read. Super brutal. We are going to be having a live stream discussion of The Girl Next Door. Let me make sure I get the date right before I... I it's next week. I just don't remember what day next week. And I should know. It's ridiculous that I don't even know my own schedule off the top of my head. It's pretty hilarious, actually. Okay, I thought it was next Thursday, and it is. It's going to be our discussion about The Girl Next Door, which will have spoilers as well, on Thursday, April 7th, same time as the stream tonight, 7 p.m. Central Time. So hope to see you guys there. God, that was a hard read, but spoiler, I rated it five stars. It was impactful, emotional, but really well written. I think it was the writing. It's like that could have been done, like, so terribly. Uh, it could have been just, like, a very... Uh, I can't even describe what it could have been like. It just could have been done in a distasteful way, but I thought Ketchum did it in the opposite way. I thought he was as tasteful as he could be with that subject matter, but at the same time, he was uh, vivid enough with his descriptions to be impactful and to like make you like, oh my God, this is terrible. This is like horrific. This is the worst. So it, it was emotional at the same time, if that makes sense. All right. I'm sorry, I'm stuffed up now. Oh, Ashley is listening to the audiobook of The Dark Half. And of course, we're talking about The Dark Half by Stephen King. Kat is asking who the narrator is. Ashley says she has to check. William says, need more horror in my reading starting next month. That's great to hear, William. I hope you pick some fun stuff to read next month. There are so many wonderful options out there. I know my friend Juan from Plagued by Visions talks about how um, he's got this awesome tag out called like the Faces of Horror tag, which I haven't done, but I would like to do that tag eventually, maybe in like a couple of months because I have like five tags I'm supposed to do and I have not done them yet, but I keep meaning to, but and I will do them, but just in a while. But the Faces of Horror tag that he's he's been doing or he originally did and other people are doing is basically like you know horror gets a lot of hate from people especially mainstream readers and if you're talking about movies mainstream moviegoers just horror as a genre in both fiction and in movies it just gets shit on pardon my french but it's true everyone's all like uh it's so lowbrow uh it's like what's wrong with you if you like horror a lot of people are like that and it's such a shame because I feel like some of the most impactful books are horror books, and it, it's not what everyone thinks it is. It's not just, like, mindless fun. Don't get me wrong. Some horror is mindless fun, 
and there's nothing wrong with that. Books like The Rats, this is mindless fun. There's not a lot of character development here. This is kind of trashy in a way. And let me just do a little sidebar and just tell you my thoughts so far about this. I love animal attack books. They're like my favorite books ever like in horror because I like a good time. It doesn't have to have a meaning to me. It doesn't have to have a big message. I love just like mindless animal attack stuff with lots of gore and lots of grossness and lots of absurd like, oh, his dick got chewed off. Like, cause this happens in these books, some like a lot of these eighties books, especially with animal attacks, like guys, their penises get chewed off. It's really disturbing, but also hilarious. I'm sorry, but it, it's, it, it's so over the top and ridiculous that it's enjoyable. Among other kills in animal attack books, there's just a lot of good stuff in them. However, having said that, Rats by James Herbert, so far I am not liking it as much as The Nest by Gregory A. Douglas. Also an old school horror book, an animal attack book. I like The Nest a lot better. I just thought the writing was better. Uh, not saying that James Herbert isn't wonderful. I do like the rats. I just think that the gruesomeness isn't there as much as The Nest. Oh my god. And this is a book I want to read. Speaking of more animal attack books, and the most bonkers writer of all time, you know, William W. Johnstone, he's insane. So he has a book called Bats, which is also an animal attack book. And yes, I have got to read it. And so she says it's totally bonkers. Yes. Johnstone is known for bonkers books. That's his, like, style. Yeah, cockroaches with the nest. Oh my god. Like, I can't believe I like the nest. I don't know why I'm so into, like, cockroach stories, because I hate cockroaches, but the nest is amazing, and I'm liking it more than the rats, especially because I read a, a middle grade book called The Rats last year, and it was incredible. Like, some of the kills in that middle grade book were more drawn out than the kills in this adult horror book, and that's saying something. And by the way, The Rats, the middle grade book, I learned about it from Cameron Chaney. So, Cameron, if you're still here, thank you for telling me about that book. Of course, I cannot think of the author right now, and I don't know where the book is. If you remember, I know you probably remember, I don't know where it is. Um, just, I love that book. Thank you for recommending it. All right, again, we are wrapping up. I know I said we were wrapping up, but we really are. I'm just making sure no one's saying anything else about, um, about the troop. I'm so glad mostly everyone enjoyed it. Um, if you didn't enjoy it, I'm so sorry. I'm hoping that my next book club big pick, if you didn't like this one, you'll like the next one. There's always a next time, and rating is subjective, and it makes sense that some people would maybe dislike a book while others love it. It's just the way it is, and that's the beauty of opinions. Everyone has a different one, but we could all come together and discuss why we have different opinions, and I think it's a, a lot of fun because everyone's experiences that form their opinions are so varied and different, and that's what makes it so fascinating to learn about why people think the way they do. It's just great. I, it's just something I like, and I've liked it ever since I had this class in college where we talked about film together. It was like, it was called American Film as a Literary Art. That was the name of the class. And it was so good. And the whole class would like talk about our opinions about the movies we were watching and, uh, you know, if we liked it or what this meant and what that meant. And we really would analyze things to like a T, like really like dissected things. And I just love that. Oh my God. Hmm. Just reading more. Justin says, Kin is great so far, of course, by Keelan Patrick Burke. He's referencing. Um, very different from other Burke books, he said. Hi. Hi, Mr. Martinstar. Thank you for joining. We're just talking about the troop. Everyone seems to like it, at least as far as I can tell. Nobody in the chat said that they disliked it or hated it. Most people have rated it a four, a four and a half, or a five. I rated it a five. I really loved it. Jamie says, as we're talking about horror, we were just talking about Juan's Faces of Horror tag and how horror gets just a bad reputation. And it's such a shame because books like The Troop, especially, I feel like if someone who didn't like horror, yes, they would have a hard time reading it because of the, the goriness of it and like the gross stuff in it. But at the same time, you would find a lot of psychological and like, um, just bigger, deeper meanings hidden within these pages. And like, you could really break down like what this is trying to say. And so I think that horror does such a good job at that. A lot of times because situations that are presented in horror books are great backgrounds for examination of human nature and how things can play out and speculation about why things are the way, the way they are. Why do things scare us? 
uh, why do we react certain ways to certain things? I just think horror is such a ripe environment to explore those types of things. And that's why it just doesn't get enough love. And, you know, people can scoff at it all they want. But to me, it's like there's something there. There's something there to explore and to dive into. Cat overall says The Troop is a terrific horror book. I agree. I agree. I'm so glad we liked it. Uh, the funny thing is, so here's an example. So Cat and I in our private book club that's separate than this book club, everyone was supposed to read The Troop, but uh, only three people, including me and Cat, went to the book club meeting. Our friend Michelle, I don't blame her. She can't really... Uh, really really read horrific stuff and she's really just in the book club to do us a favor but nobody else in our club like really likes horror as much as us except our friend melissa who couldn't go because she was having a baby that month or this very month so she just had a baby totally understandable she couldn't go but i'm like oh my god so many people in the club did not read this book and it was like one of the best books we read as a club and yet they didn't read it because like our horror book club doesn't really like horror that much and we, we would joke about that me and cat about how some people in our club don't like horror that much and we're like what the uh, it's just kind of funny and Kat agrees there was more to the troop than just gore and gross stuff lots of themes running throughout the whole thing totally agree great description and uh basically overall statement about the book good good uh point jamie horror books and movies can bring great catharsis with them so very true it's a way for us to come to grips with some of our deepest fears a way for us to think about how we would react in certain situations a way for us to think about humanity as a whole it might not always be pleasant but sometimes it almost makes living with the horrors we do already live with more manageable in a way if that makes sense so even though it's kind of like a a twofold experience, it still can be a catharsis of sorts. Thank you, assistant. My assistant, Paul, brought me this lovely beverage. It is Bailey's Irish cream. And also a pup. You could see his tail here. He is visiting me. And now just kind of standing in the doorway. Go ahead. Go to go with dad. Yes. He is looking at me. You can't see. Can you see? Go. Come over here, Jackson. Look at this. No, his head's too his head's too low. Jackson, go ahead, Jax. Go with that. Go ahead. <laughs> he he likes to be on camera. We've learned this from like streaming for many years. My dog likes to be on camera quite a lot. Before we close out, Kat says, the ending of the troop was thought-provoking, symbolic ending for Kat herself, she thinks. Max is shunned by society, so he hungers metaphorically hungers for where he can be alone since he is technically actually alone i think that is a great observation cat that's great analysis kelly says we need more jackson i know i, I wish i could have like he's hard to pick up i should have picked him up but uh, maybe next time i'll get him in at the beginning and get him a little guest appearance Mr. Morningstar says, glad to hear it. Haven't tried any Nick Cutter yet, but I agree. Horror speaks to me in all sorts of meaningful ways that literary snobs may overlook. I think that's so well said, Mr. Morningstar, because like some people are just like, eh, horror, it's the worst. It's not, it's not any good. It's, it's not academic enough. But to me, it's like, it is academic. And I don't know why this means acad <laughs> academic. No, it's not academic enough. I don't know what I was trying to do there. By the way, guys, I'm addicted to ASMR. I've been doing like this in my spare time I'm like why am I trying to like do ASMR and I'm like not an ASMRist <laughs> but I've been like doing this like in my spare time which is what like ASMR people do if you guys don't know it's like sounds and stuff like tapping like oh, hello <laughs> I don't know I've been doing it a lot so I feel like my hand motions are because of these freaking videos I've been addicted to lately and it's not on purpose it's just like sunken into my consciousness now all right, guys, as we close out, I'm going to leave you guys with some nostalgic stuff to get you hyped. I got an Are You For The Dark candle. So if you guys are joining me for my old school thematic month of reading and, wa and or watching, because you don't have to watch stuff if you only want to read, and you don't have to read stuff if you only want to watch stuff. But if you're doing either, I'm so excited and so thankful that you're participating because I work so hard on this project and I'm so pumped for it. I cannot wait and I've got so much planned. In fact, the kickoff is tomorrow. So I already kind of got together some clothes. Like this is one of my thematic outfits I have. It's like a shirt I wore when I was eight years old. I still have it and somehow can still fit, <laughs> fit in it somehow. I don't know. But yes, it, at the bottom, you could see there's the actual Rugrats. So I also wore special like kind of 90-ish 
90s-ish looking earrings for this stream, just cause. So guys, uh, I hope you guys are hyped. I can't wait to hear about it on Instagram. Again, if you're gonna tag, if you're gonna do anything, like post any pictures or post anything, like your TBRs, or your watch list, please tag me so I could see. Cause I don't always get to see everybody's posts by just scrolling. Um, but I am looking forward to it and I hope you guys join in. And just a um, reminder, like I said, the Grown Lake Store stream is next Thursday. April 7th at 7 p.m. Central Time. And then our next two book club picks, you could read one, the other, or neither if you're not interested. We are having a stream discussion for, and this is way in, in May. It's our books for April. Our official books are The Book of the Dam, or Book of the Dam, no the, Book of the Dam by D.A. Fowler, which should be awesome. I'm really excited about that one. Our other book is Feast, but it's also known under the name Ritual by Graham Masterton. So those are our two official book club picks. And also my king pick is The Dark Half. So if you guys want to read any of those books, all of them or some of them or none of them, that's okay. But if you read any of them, I'm having live streams about all three different days. And I think all but one of the streams are in May. So most of the streams will take place in May. So you have a long time to read them. But the Feast slash Ritual by Graham Masterton will take place at the end of April. So if you're looking to get started on one, Feast is the one with the discussion that is the soonest to now. So that one's the 24th of April. So Feast needs to be done by the 24th because that's the stream. And then the others you have until May. So again, those are the books coming up for next time. Guys, this book club means a lot to me. I never imagined in my wildest dreams that so many people will be voting on my polls each month for the books and so many people will be would be in my Discord. I had no earthly idea that this would unfold this way. So thank you so much. You guys make it such a blast because reading is great and fun and it is a solitary thing, but it's even better when it becomes a group thing, honestly, in my opinion. I know we all like our like alone time. A lot of readers are introverts, but I think reading's even better when you could share it with others and hear other opinions about what you're reading. I just think that's fun. I think this is a, a good statement before we go. Kelly says, it seems like horror, though, has been starting to get more credit with authors like Stephen Graham Jones. Like, it's becoming more, you know, widely popular. I think people like Grady Hendrix has kind of made it cooler uh, and okay to like horror. Like, it's not as, as like, hidden anymore. I really think that freaking Hendrix is making it more popular in a way. And, of course, your biggest guy, Stephen King, kind of made horror cool to begin with. I think that's a good statement to end it on. Okay, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up. I can't wait. I hope some people document April stuff yet again. That's what I'm gonna leave it with. Happy April's Eve, everybody, or April Fool's Day's Eve. I don't know. Uh, for this time, guys, that's it for me. Till next time, you guys know what you can do. Keep on killing it. Appreciate all of you.